Um, so, so the so the purpose of this talk was, well, I guess just to kick off the first, um, you know, um, algorithmic trading meetup, and I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, work that I've done over the last few years, particularly the uh, the pandas project for for Python, and how um, some of the tools that that are in it could be useful for uh, working with you know higher frequency financial data and you know, sort of look at some code and data and do you know, some interesting things. So, so my background, I uh, so about six years ago, I started out as as a, a research uh, research quant at at AQR, uh, which is a not an algorithmic trading company, but a um, quantitative asset manager down in Greenwich, Connecticut. And I worked there for about three years, and I was managing credit uh, credit derivative strategies, um, helping manage credit derivative strategies. And there's where I got interested in building better data tools, um, in particular for Python. Like I used R, and was um, there was a lot that I liked about R, some things that I didn't like. Um, I wanted to have a really uh, sort of rich uh, financial data manipulation tool that could also be used as the foundation for building more complex uh, systems, especially for uh, for asset management and trading, and so I've, I found that you know when you have um, you know people do build you know people do build algorithmic trading systems in R, but R is not very good at general purpose programming. So I, I felt that you know doing things in Python um, you know would make all the code that we're building more maintainable and scalable. Um, I am uh, I've been on my own for a couple of years and work, working on a new company. So if you uh, are you know interested in what I'm doing, just stay tuned on on Twitter and the Twitter and the blogosphere. Um, hope to talk more about that at some point in the future. I uh, well, I didn't succeed in making this, <laughs> the images bigger, um, but I just wrote this book, so Python for data analysis. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how much money I make on each book, but not very much. Uh, <laughs> but the the purpose of the book was not you know not to sell a lot of books. Well, I guess it was in a way, but uh, I was looking to to create a resource that that would enable. Um, People who aren't necessarily, um, you know, expert programmers to to pick up um, the tools in the scientific Python stack, uh, NumPy, NumPy, which is the core array processing library, IPython, which is the computing and computing and development environment. It's where you actually do your uh, code development and you know, sort of hacking around with data. Uh, Matplotlib is the um, sort of the main plotting library. It doesn't make uh, it doesn't make beautiful plots uh, out of the box, but you know you can do a lot of really nice things with it with some effort. I think it, you can think of it as kind of like a low-level uh, plotting toolkit um, that, with some elbow grease, can uh, make some pretty good visualizations. And then Pandas, which is has been my project for the last um, almost five years, and it's um, the high-level. Um, data analysis and you know, time, you know, for financial users, uh, time series processing toolkit. Um, so I wanted to put everything uh, in one book, and given that you know some of the a lot of the stuff in the book didn't exist three years ago or, or even two years ago, um, so I felt the time was right to uh, to have a book that would um, sort of lower the bar for uh, for learning these tools and, and putting them to some productive use in, in your work. Um, so Pandas, if you know much about Python, um, it's, a, it's a, a set of data tools that's built on top of NumPy. So NumPy is the array library for Python, and, uh, but it's a pretty low level, uh, it's a pretty low level library. It just gives you um, essentially the, what you get, the, the kinds of things that you have in MATLAB. So you have um, vectors and matrices um, and functions for, uh, you know, that you can apply to, um, to vectors and matrices. So, you know, things like exponent and square root and you can do, you know, sum across axis and things like that. Um, it provides all of the indexing um, and sort of low-level data manipulation um, that you do with arrays. But it doesn't provide, you know, high-level constructs for working with some of the data types that you have in the real world, uh, things like time series and being able to express, um, you know, the kinds of you know, actual business logic that you, you write uh, on time series with different frequencies and, you know, date offsets and, um, time zones and all of that, all that stuff. Um, it also tackles what I would call the uh, data manipulation, the data um, data alignment problem, and that, um, that financial data is very heterogeneous. It comes from lots of different sources. You might have two sets of time series where one is, you know, has holiday date data for the holidays, and the other one doesn't. And you want to still be able to you know, combine that data together. Uh, without having to you know, stop and uh, realign the realign the matrices, so that's just a problem that uh, the pandas takes care of under the scenes. If you add together 
two time series that don't align, it will automatically align them and insert missing data in the result. Um, so in practice, that, that makes life a lot more pleasant. You still have to deal with the fact that you have missing data, um, but it's not uh, constantly barking at you that the, the matrices or the vectors aren't the right size. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's become very popular in, in the financial world, especially in, um, in asset management, where you can, um, where you can run back tests and, 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 build, um, and build trading signals typically with just by loading, um, you know, loading static blocks of data and then creating signals from math operations on those data rather than um, algorithmic trading, which is typically event-based, where you, you observe data one, um, you know, one time step at a time and you make sequential decisions um, based on that. So, you, um, so the decision that you make at time t will depend on you know, what the decisions that you made prior to that. Um, so in a lot of asset management use cases, um, that's not, I guess, not how the signals are constructed and having uh, a tool that, I guess, enables, you know, matrix processing without some of the data line, the headache, um, you know, makes, makes, uh, makes people very happy. It's you're being used in a lot of other places, um, you know, ad tech and, you know, any kind of web analytics and people like processing, you know, data on the server side, you know, backing web applications. Um, and Quantopian uses, uses Pandas in their, in their platform, so. Um, but it's not complete. It's you know, uh, like all open source packages, there's a uh, you know list of you know things to do, which goes down to the floor and you know out the elevator and down to the bottom <laughs> bottom floor of, uh, of the building. And it gets longer. It's seemingly every day. Uh, so it's so it's a very active project and one that you know if, if if you find the kinds of things you can do with Pandas interesting, and you find something that um, you can't do and you would like to be able to do, I, I would encourage you to. Uh, engage with the community and, and uh, see what's going on. Um, <clears throat> anyway, was, this, this slide got completely screwed. Um, all right, so why do we care about um, using Pandas for, um, for algorithmic trading research? Um, so I would, I would say that, that Pandas is most useful um, for doing analysis of static data sets. So, um, so if you're building if you're building a trading you know a trading simulation, you'll generate lots and lots of data while you're um, doing your trading simulation, and you can take all of that data and then do um, very easily sort of slice and dice, um, and you know do resampling and sort of bin and aggregate, um, do all of that you know post post simulation analysis using pandas very efficiently, um, and a lot of work in the library has been invested in um, in vectorized operations on time series. So if you have um, you know, a high frequency time series, and you want to select, um, you know, if you want to select the bar, you know, the most recent observed um, value as of, you know, 9:37 in the morning at each point in time. It will do that, you know, look up on the time series in one statement. Um, so it, it does a lot of the sort of, you know, um, I guess data selection and um, data manipulation conveniences that you, that you need to do with time series. It has very nice support for resampling. So if you have higher frequency data and you want to, you know, bin it as you know four hour or one hour or one day or one month, um, you can sort of go from high frequency to low frequency or low frequency to high frequency um, with very simple commands. So if you have data at different frequencies, you can find a common frequency, resample the time series to that frequency, and then combine them. Um, another another feature area that I won't have necessarily that much. Time to talk about is that if you have very complex data that might be you know four or five or six dimensional, um, Pandas enables you to to represent that data in a hierarchical way so that things are organized into in sort of a tree fashion, but the data is still contained in a table or a, a single uh, a single time series, and it gives you a very nice way of um, sort of rearranging uh, what could be very uh, very high dimensional, very complex data. Um, where otherwise, in other languages, I've seen people work with this kind of data, and you end up with kind of a, a tangle of you know spaghetti code uh, teasing you know the particular subset of data that you want out of a you know four or five dimensional data set. Um, one thing about high dimensional data sets is that sometimes people will, will store that data in a like a hypercube, so you have like a five dimensional matrix. Um, but there are lots of cases where one or one or more of the dimensions um, will be very sparse in some of the other um, some of the other dimensions. So there might you know be one combination of three dimensions where you know 
it's uh, you know 99.9% .9 of the values are missing along the other two dimensions. So, so pandas enables you to represent that data in a dense fashion without you know running out of memory, uh, but you can still do um, express operations on it uh, in a pretty simple way. Um, of course, I go th go through all of this in absurd detail in, in the book. Um, <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, so the rest of the talk, I'm just. Um, so I, I, Quantopian kindly uh, gave me a little bit of uh, minute bar data to play with, um, which unfortunately I don't think that I will be able to give you. Um, but if you do have minute bar data for some of these stocks, then you can um, you could reproduce this analysis. I'll post the notebook online after <coughs> after the talk. How do I go full screen in Safari, or can I? is OS 10.6. Yeah, Maybe I can't. You go to Windows, Windows Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. The little yellow icon in the top left. No, that will minimize. It's okay. I, I mean, this is actually not that much screen real estate is, is lost here. Let me um, hide, the, hide the toolbar. Okay, there we go. All right. So, um, so I'm running the. Um, this, well, I, I don't have too much time to talk about the, the IPython notebook, but this is a, a web application that's part of the part of the IPython project, um, and the idea is that this gives you a. Um, let me just create some random data and plot it. My kernel died. All right, let's try this again. Okay, so so this is a well, this runs in the browser, and, and the idea is that it's a it's a comp, you know, I guess what they call it, they call a computational notebook. So I have code cells, so very similar to Mathematica. If you guys use um, use Mathematica, so I have cells of code, and when I um, execute them, it sends the code to a running Python process. It executes it, and then it comes back with any um, output from the from the code. So if I put print hello world here, then it shows. Hello world, right, right there, along with the, along with the plot. So it's the, the basic mechanic of, of what's going on here. So I've got um, minute bar data that's contained in some, um, some CSV files. So let me show you what this data looks like. So bang, head. Let's get the first ten rows of downloads, minute bars, <coughs> Apple. Who doesn't love looking at looking at Apple data? So the so the minibar data is just contained in a um, in a CSV file. So we've got volume, high, low, close, price, date, timestamp, uh, open price. So if I want to um, to load this data into um, into a pandas, the main uh, if you've never used pandas before, um, the main data structure is called data frame, very similar to R. And so I, if I do um, pandas.readcsv, it loads that into a data frame. And now I get back um, a data frame that contains all of the data in that CSV file. And these are just the first, uh, the first five rows. Um, and now to work with this data a little more efficiently, um, notice that the timestamps are contained in the DT column. And that's not really that useful because we want to associate those timestamps with all of the other columns because they're the timestamps for the for the actual data. So, uh, so what we can do is select the DT column from the make this a little bigger. Select the DT column from the data frame, and we'll go do pandas to date time, which converts um, those are strings, and so it's converting those to um, to actual timestamp values. So if I do Select the first value. Now I've got um, when I select an element, I've got a timestamp object instead of a string, and then I can um, assign the data frames index to be pandas to date time, and then that string column. So I'm actually going to change this to pop dt. So pop is going to um, return the column and delete it from the data frame, convert it to timestamps, and then set it to be the index of the data frame. Uh, so if all of that goes well, then I now have uh, a data frame that has a date time index, which is what we're looking for. And if I look at 
um, look at the, the first five rows of the data frame, data frame.head. I now have five, um, five columns and then a, a timestamp index. And that, the reason that that's useful is now when I select, say, uh, close price, I get back um, a, time, a single time, uh, one-dimensional time series object. So you can see that it goes from to, uh, the beginning of 2008 uh, through, looks exactly five years of data up through three days ago. Um, and so there's some other things that are interesting with this data. So it's in Eastern Coast time, but the data is all shifted ahead by five hours. So maybe you guys can, Contopian can tell me why it shifted ahead by five hours. But um, so what we can do is uh, we can take the its index, and I'm going to use the shift method and shift by one period frequency minus 5h. So what that's going to do is shift all of the timestamps, um, subtract five hours from each one. So I guess I also could have done shift minus one. I don't want to t chance my luck, but it won't work because it worked earlier. <laughs> Okay, so now if we um, look at the data frame, you can see that on uh, January 7th, 2013, we've got data that goes from, uh, goes up until uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's UTC. It's UT oh, it's UTC. Yeah. Well, I looked actually, it looked like there was no, there was no uh, daylight savings time transitions in the data. So, yeah. Um, <coughs> So one thing that uh, so one thing that's nice about these time series objects, if you've ever used um, XTS in R, then you, you might be familiar with uh, with this kind of syntax. So suppose that we wanted to select all of the data just for one single uh, one single date. So we can do that in a, a, a shortcut way by passing uh, passing a string just the just the base date. So suppose I want the data on January seventh of this year. So if I pass the string 2013-01-07, it grabs just the, um, just the data on that date. And you can see that it goes from uh, 9.31. So this, the first bar in the data is the data from 9.30 to 9.31. And then that goes up through, um, through the end of the day, the data at, from you know, the, last, uh, the last minute of the day from 3.59 to 4 o'clock. So I've seen, uh, I've seen bar conventions in in both ways. I think, I don't know, I think this is the more common one, but um, and somebody can correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. <clears throat> so, yeah, I was doing a little bit of analysis here on like the, the distribution of, um, distribution of hours in the data set to see if there were, you know, if it was, uh, if it had daylight savings time in it or not, and I concluded that I concluded that it didn't. Um, Is this the environment you usually work in for doing data analysis? Uh, I often, I sometimes use it. It's it's like it's nice when you're sharing an analysis with somebody else and you wanna you wanna tell a story about what you did mm -hmm. um, because the you have the, the code at each step and then maybe some output and plots associated with it. But um, what I'm doing. You know, I guess more hardcore development. I'm, I'm just using the terminal version of this, and then writing code in Emacs. Uh, so I prefer to write the, write the code in Emacs. Um, somebody created an Emacs uh, interface to the notebook. So, uh, so if you like really an Emacs lover, you can you know you can use the notebook without leaving Emacs. I haven't gotten it working myself, but um, yeah, it's pretty wild. All right, so. Um, so I loaded the data into a slightly different, um, slightly different format. I'll explain why later. But, um, so I was looking at. So if we look at, um, so if we look at an individual, um, just the the timestamps that are associated with the time series. So here, uh, well, let me go back to my my DF above. So if I look at the, the index here, these are the timestamps for each of those time series. So I can do things like request the, um, an array of hours, so extract the hour from each timestamp. So if you wanted to do um, some analysis on by, by hour of day, you could say, um, you know, 
data frame group by data frame index hour. And then if I call the size function on group by, that just gives me a histogram of the, um, the, num the count, the number of, you know, of each hour uh, in the data set, but that you could also um, compute other more complicated things. Suppose you wanted to get um, some statistics on the closing price, you know, I, some statistics on the volume um, at by, you know, by hour of day, you could say dot volume dot describe. And let's try unstack. Right. And then, so that gives, let me see here. Where are we? Okay. And so then that gives me a table of um, a bunch of summary statistics for each hour of the day. So you can see the number of observations um, for hour nine, and then the mean volume, standard deviation min and min interquartal region at maximum value. Um, so it gives you kind of a nice facility to do some, some quick summaries of here. This is a, a data set with a, with a half million rows and you know, doing all these computations is very, um, very snappy. So another nice thing, especially for working with bar data, is, is a very common um, computation, especially if you want to look at sort of event-based studies or you know, things that go on around particular times of day, like you might want to look at price actions around, um, let's say, uh, news announcements, you know, which often you know, data will be released at 10 o'clock in the morning or at, or at 8.30 in the morning, and you might want to look at um, price changes from 10 o'clock to 10.05 and every, you know, each day, and then you could sort of link that up with a data source that had um, the actual data about the announcements and what the announcements were, and then you could look at uh, reactions to um, well, the data is fairly you know the data is fairly coarse at the minute, at the minute bar level, but uh, you can still get some kind of a picture of what was the market reaction to um, you know, to various um, events during the day. And you guys where you can look you know compare you know if there were lead or lag relationships. You know IBM goes up, and what what is that? What impact does that have? Either a lead or a lag relationship on other stock price movements. Um, so for doing those kinds of computations on um, on this data, so I guess a lot of about what I'm about to show you is going to be based uh, based on that. Um, I'm going to come back to this a little a little later. Um, so from where I loaded the data up here, I've got. Um, I guess another piece of code, because I've got 10 stocks here, and um, I was going to do an analysis on all of them. So if I have time, I'm going to show you, what, do what I'm about to show you on all of them and see if there's any interesting results. Um, but the idea was to do what I showed you, load each um, bar data file, convert the, convert the timestamps, put those in a Python dictionary, and then at the end, put them in a pandas panel object. So a panel is just a three-dimensional um, data frame, so we can have stocks by timestamps by data item. So that makes it very easy to slice out if you just want the closing price, you know, the closing bar prices for all of the stocks in your universe. Um, you can grab, um, you can grab that slice out of the data set uh, in a simple way. So that's you know, the reason why uh, the data is a bit different here. So, <clears throat> so I've got my panel object, which just has Apple data in it, and so. Um, so as I said, I've got stocks by timestamps by data item, and now I want to select out um, so the closing bar prices, open bar prices, and volume data into individual <coughs> variables. So I'm going to grab a cross section along the minor axis. So the minor axis here are the data items. So I want the close price, open price, and volume. Um, there's some other you know ways that you could get get the data out with a different syntax. But I'll run this. And so if we look at uh, closing price head, you can see that it's just a, um, a data frame with a single column, just my Apple stock, and then the first first five timestamps there. And now one thing that's, uh, that's nice about the um, thing I was mentioning about looking at data at particular points in time during the day so here I have this time series which goes over the course of about five years. Suppose that I want to grab the um, closing bar price at um, at ten o'clock at ten o'clock in the morning every day. So what I can do is um, the time series has a method at time, and if I do that and pass in a Python 
time object, so I'll pass in the time 10 o'clock, um, that returns a new time series which selects out um, the data points at, um, at 10 o'clock every day. So while I was on the train today, I was thinking that it would be nice to have a method that would do an, um, do an as-of computation so that if there's no data at right, right at 10 o'clock that it would grab the most recent bar. I don't have a function to do that, but uh, if somebody gets really energetic and writes it for me, I'll be happy to add it to the library. Um, <clears throat> so something I, I, was, I was thinking a little bit about, and it, you know, people would give me a really hard time because I, you know, I, I do, be, you know, being an ex-quant, like I do a bunch of trading on the side, but like I don't really do anything quantitative, and people get like, people really tease me about it that I, I don't have a system that's more like, you know, I like Apple kind of thing. Uh, that was working out really great for me uh, until pretty recently. So, um, <clears throat> so another thing that we can do similar to at time is that we can select. Um, so let's just take a look at the the volume data. So I've got a big. So I've got a data frame that has all of just the, the volume data for only Apple. I guess maybe I, I'll I'll go back and change it to more stocks later. Um, but suppose I was interested in looking at you know, sort of the, the, the distribution of volume um, throughout the day. And you'll probably guess, you know, what you know, maybe you probably know what that distribution looks like. Um, but if I use the between time method, I can uh, pass two time objects to so say I want to get data from 9:31 uh, in the morning through until 10 at 10 at 10 o'clock. So I just pass two time objects now. Uh, and then that gives me back a new uh, a new data frame that just has data um, between those two times for each day. Um, so then, what you can do is um, suppose you wanted to compare, you know, split up the day into say three buckets. I called them um, morning, afternoon, and the last ten minutes of the day. So I said nine, I make sure I didn't make a mistake here. So from 9:31 to 12:30. I called that the morning. We could debate about you know where where we decide that the morning ends. Maybe at noon. Uh, we could change that. Um, then from 12:31 to 3:50, and then from 3:51 to to 4 o'clock. So I select those out, stored them in um, in three variables, and then for each of them. Um, <coughs> Is not, that's, not, that's not what I wanted to show you. Um, so for each of them now, what I'm going to do is, so those are um, minute bar data, so I want to aggregate those for each day, um, put them all into a single table, and then make a, make a plot so I can see how that um, will take the, um, the morning data, and I call the resample method. I pass the, the target frequency, which you can call it daily. Um, change it to something else like monthly. And I want to compute for each group, for each day, the, um, the mean volume, per, you know, so I guess because the number of minutes in each, in each bucket is different, so I want the mean amount uh, for each day. So when I do that, I get back um, a new time series, a new data frame that contains time series that's, um, that's now daily frequency. Uh, so it went from having, the morning data went from having you know, 200,000 200, observations to 1,800. So I'm going to do that for each of those buckets. Um, so I made a little function to, to aggregate them, put them in a, put those in a data frame that have with columns morning, afternoon, and last 10 minutes of the day. Um, and then I wanted to make sort of a, you know, some very simple plot. So I'm going to um, take a further mean of those daily daily means and and plot that stuff, and so I get a I get a plot that looks about like this, and so we, we can sh we can see that um, the last ten minutes of the day are very exciting. People are you know rushing to um, to get trades in. I think um, a lot of mutual funds don't make trades until until the end of the day. Or um, if you if you work for a financial institution, you may have like compliance checks where you request trades in the morning and then you can't trade until 3.45. I think that's what, that's what I used to not be able to trade until 3.45 every day. So um, yeah, so I, I know lots of explanations why you know people are 
really heavily trading in the last 10 minutes of the day. Um, so, so I just looked at this data and I said, okay, well, maybe, um, you know, what, what, you know, does the price action at the end of the day tell us anything about, um, you know, what's going to happen to the stock price the next day? Um, so, all right, so we can go a bit, you know, we can go a bit, a bit crazy here with, with the analysis. So, um, so I thought, okay, let's, let's look at the um, change in stock price in the last 10 minutes of the day and then the stock price overnight, and then the stock price in the, thirst, the first 30 minutes of the uh, next trading session. Um, so this is, you know, getting at this, I guess, fairly, fairly sophisticated um, analysis. And you have to be very, very careful because you have, you know, the open price at each bar and the closed price at each bar. So you have to make sure that none of your, uh, none of your data overlaps. So, so what I did here is, let me make this bigger, as well I computed times, so I guess my open bar, my 10 a.m. bar, the start of the last 10 minutes of the day and the closing time, um, and I selected the, the open prices at the beginning of the day, the beginning of each day, um, the closing price in the 10, 10 a.m. bar, so that's going to be the last print it at 9.59, um, and then I guess the open price at the beginning of the last 10 minutes of the day, and the last print at the end of the day. Okay, hopefully I got all that right. And then, um, and then I wrote this little helper function normalize, so there's a, a, help, there's a function in, in Pandas that lets you strip the time information from, a, um, from the timestamps in the time series because we want all we want all of this data to line up. So we want to throw away the because this is going to be 9:31, 10 o'clock, 3:51, and uh, 4 o'clock. And 4 o'clock. So we want to throw away the time information so everything um, everything lines up. <coughs> so I do that, and um, so now if I look at the open prices, now I have. Um, just a time series where everything is, whenever it's midnight, it, it throws away the uh, throws away the time because nobody wants to see an array of all timestamps at midnight. So these are the um, the first print of the day, um, the open price, first bar of the day for Apple. And then what I can do is I can compute the um, with very nice syntax compute the overnight returns and the returns. I guess I should also compute the last 10 minutes or the day returns. So the overnight returns, we want to take the, um, the price at the beginning of the day, that's the price open, and take the price at the end of the day from yesterday. So I take price close, shift one. So that says, okay, price open today, the last price yesterday, shift one. So that's yesterday's price. Uh, divide those and subtract one, get, get percent returns. And I'll do the same thing to get the morning returns, take the 10 a.m. price, divided by the open price minus one. So I get the 9.30 to 10 o'clock returns. We could also throw in here, um, I'm going to have it's down here. So here's the returns from the, you guys are all quants, somebody will probably spot like a horrible error in my analysis here. So I'll also, also compute the, the returns in the last 10 minutes of the day. Um, and so you might, you know, be interested to say, okay, well, what's the correlation of the overnight returns with the uh, morning returns? So well, I spoiled it for you. Um, so I take the overnight returns, and I actually don't want to shift one. Why is this here? Okay. Uh, wait, wait. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. So you see that there's a little bit of a little bit of negative correlation between the overnight returns and the morning returns. So if there's you know, I guess bad news overnight, uh, stock price goes down and you know people buy it back and it goes up a little bit in the first half hour. Or you know it went up overnight and then you know, people don't feel as good once they start trading and they you know the you know the sort of the overnight gains all that. I mean we can come up with a lot of stories about what went on, uh, but we can measure this a little more quantitatively and, and do something more sophisticated than. Uh, correlation with our favorite tool, uh, linear regression, and um, you can compute a uh, simple linear regression using Pandas' OLS function, 
um, which is just you know like a simple linear regression, but it also does data alignment and missing data handling, so it you know gets rid of any missing data and makes sure that um, everything lines up. So I want to try to predict um, try to predict Apple's price movement in the in the morning using the overnight return. So I say my y variable is uh, morning returns and um, the explanatory variable is the overnight returns, and so um, so we get a so we get a negative uh, negative coefficient, not a very high R squared, but you know a very significant um, negative relationship. So the question I had, well, okay, I wonder if there's even more negative reaction to you know let's say the stock rallying at the end of the day or uh, selling off at the end of the day, and then maybe it rebounds the next morning. So we might as well throw in you know the price movement. At, um, at the end of the day. We could change this, so notice this is a full sample regression, so um, I haven't visualized it for you at all. It was a, it was a coefficient of minus point, minus point 0.13. Um, so we might want to do a dynamic regression and see how this relationship changed over time. So if we modify this to be, um, to have a window of 60 periods, so th about three months of data, uh, at a time. And I also put in this min periods parameter. So the idea is that if the amount of data in the window falls below 60 and you don't have min periods, then it won't run the regression at that point in time. So that kind of gives you a little bit of flexibility in your data quality. Um, you know, sometimes you want all of the data to be there and to not run a regression if, uh, if it's not there. <coughs> so, so if I do that, you see we get, um, and then I plot the um, plot the regression coefficient. You can see that the um, the relationship between those two <coughs> two returns changed quite a bit um, quite a bit over time. So it happens to be that right lately there's continuation, at least statistically. I don't know. I should probably add significance levels here, but there appears to be continuation recently. Whereas you know at the end of 2011 there was a lot of a lot of reversal, um, at least in this in this model. So we can also Qu question. So yep. Initially, uh, OLS just by default is doing the normal, just a regular one. Yeah. And that one parameter is doing a running one over. Correct. Running one over time. Oh, that's right. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you say, okay, let's throw in, um, let's throw in the um, as another explanatory variable, the returns from the last ten minutes of yesterday's trading session. Now, I'm, I'm not being completely careful because I don't have holiday data uh, hooked in here, so to really do this properly, you would, you would need all of your you know, trading, you'd need a full trade calendar um, to, you know, I guess build a fully, fully faithful backtest out of this. But um, So I'm adding last 10 minute returns, shift by one because I want the returns yesterday, and running a three month rolling regression. Uh, to plot the um, plot the regression coefficients. So, uh, so it turns out that the the effect of the last ten minutes of the day is more significant, um, at least in terms of the regression coefficient, than the, than the overnight return. So that's interesting. Um, okay. So I said, okay, well, all right, we'll put, put our money where our mouth is. Right, let's let's uh, you know come up with a few trading strategies and. Uh, I'm just going to go say, don't try this at home. So, <laughs> you know, I'll hear from you and be like, Wes told us about this awesome straight trading strategy that made lots of money, and I went and did it, and I lost money, and you know, uh, I'm going to sue him for all of his work. So, I, so I thought there were there were a few fun strategies we could do. So you could, um, so you could, um, well, you know, we talk about position sizing and all kinds of fun stuff, but maybe we want to like. You know, get a trade in at the end of the day, um, either you know buy or short, depending on like if it's sold off in the last ten minutes of the day, you might you know you might buy like at three fifty nine, three fifty nine, uh, or if it had rallied, you might short right at the end of the day and hold it to the morning and and uh, un, and then uh, either sell or cover at the open of the next day, or you might uh, let's I was thinking of. Call this three fifty. Initially, I was doing three forty five, and then three fifty was more interesting. 
um, which is what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> um, so this is just about illustrating tools. So you might um, you might look at the return in last you know last ten minutes of the day. This is what I was just saying, and make a decision based on that. Um, or you might, um, or to be even more sophisticated, you might take our you know rolling regression, take the last ten minute return, the overnight returns, um, use the predicted return based on the regression. So this would be like a statistical arbitrage, and use that uh, use that predicted value as the as the signal. So if it you know meets some threshold, you'll make a trade, um, and then and then you hold it for half an hour and you know make or lose money, you get rid of it. So you don't hold the trade more than 30 minutes. So uh, so I've got a little function that computes sharp ratios. I want to use that for later. Uh, so for my so my simple. Yeah. Sorry. So my so my strategy where I look at um, so I'm taking the returns in the last ten minutes of the day, um, shift one because I you know my position today depends on the values yesterday. So I'm just going to take the sign of that and flip it. So I'm going to take you know take the opposite view of what happened in the last ten minutes of the day and make the simplifying assumption that I can actually get a trade in before four o'clock. Um, and so the position. Um, the price that I buy it at is price close shift one, so that's the yesterday's last price. Uh, I'm going to buy 100 shares and then either buy or sell depending on uh, depending on this indicator. Uh, and then um, to compute a very very simple back test, I take my position, so which is just a cash number now, and overnight return, which is a percent return. To take and it, but it's it's uh, time stamped with today's date. So all I need to do is take position times overnight returns. Um, I put some one here in case we change this to multiples. Have time to change it to multiple stocks, which we may not. Um, and then I plot that. Let's see if we made money. Um, all right, so we made a little bit of money. Uh, let's see here. Uh, click it. Of course, you're, you're all going to cry foul because it made a lot of money in 2008 when Apple stock price was really low. Uh, so we could we could fix that. Uh, let's see what the uh, um, sharp ratio of the crap, this guy. So the information ratio of the strategy is 0.4. Uh, we could further break it down if we wanted. Suppose that we want to group by. Um, the year of the PL and then aggregate with the sharp function so we can get a breakdown um, by year. Make this a little bigger here. So uh, so it did really awesome in 2008 and then it had a few middle, well, pretty good in 2009, some middling years. And then we better, you know, sort of get fired up and start trading this. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we can draw a conclusion off of like five data points. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and so, uh, so I looked at another variant of this of this same strategy where um, instead of selling right at the beginning of the day, we we hold it until um, until ten o'clock. So maybe like some of the price move, you know, sort of the reversals realized over the first half an hour of the trading session. So uh, to to do that, I just position is the same, and I said, okay, overnight returns plus morning returns, and, and I'm pretty sure that these aren't overlapping, so this is, I can just add these together. Well, no, I really should compound these, but please forget, you know, my, my uh, you know, technically incorrect math, but it's good enough to see that, good enough to see that the strategy doesn't really work. Um, well, it worked okay for a while, and then it's, yeah, and then it's been losing money lately. All right, so more interesting model is 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 building a um, a model based on the the rolling regression that we um, that we ran. So I was looking at the last 15 minutes, and the last 10 minutes now. So uh, so we can take um, I already computed this. So it's our same regression from before. We get overnight returns, yesterday's end of day returns. We run the regression. Let's start with six. You know, we can always you know data mine data mine the window when we're done. 
Uh, and uh, so we're on a, th a three, uh, three month regression. And now we ask the model for the predicted y value. So we do model.y predict. That's just um, the one, one uh, period ahead forecast. So taking the regression coefficients from yesterday and the current x values and computing the predicted y value. So that um, the value that we get that from that is a time series. And then uh, is that being pre-computed or because it's not a function call, right? It's an attribute, but it gets computed in cached. Yeah, it's like a cached. It's a property. So it's it's Python, Python property. Okay, so it's only calculated once you actually. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's computed on demand, but yeah. So, so we have our predicted y values. That's sort of the basis of our signal is what you know the regression is predicting for the next period. Um, we can set some you know arbitrary threshold. So if so if the uh, let's say if uh, the model thinks Apple is going to move more than 25 basis points um, over the morning session, then we put the uh, set up that th as the threshold. So if the absolute value of the predicted value exceeds the threshold, um, then we take either a plus or plus one or minus one view based on the sign of the uh, prediction, and then we'll trade 100 shares, and we, um, we're going to take the, assume that we can get in at the beginning of the day and get the price at um, the first, the open price from the first bar, which is not realistic, but we'll, we'll, we'll hope so. Um, and compute the returns again. And we get a, let's see, um, a pretty good strategy that doesn't trade all the time. So you can see that there's like long stretches where um, it, it never uh, uh, never decides to trade. Um, but then we can, uh, so then you've know, got like, that one's got like a nine sharp ratio in uh, 2013. That might just mean that it like traded on one day and made money. So like the standard deviation is like a, Really, really small. Um, I guess we could look and see what the what it is, but then um, you can you know tweak and you know play with things here. You know, if you wanted to increase the window to six months, um, and then you know change the, the threshold to be a little less. You know, so we get you know different you know, different back tests that we can look at. Um, you might want to like set a, like a maximum amount of cash to risk. Like suppose we only want to trade like. Um, you know, fifty thousand dollars in Apple. So then here, our position size is really, um, you know, cash divided by price open Apple um, shares. So let's use NumPy's round function. I could just do floor divide, right? Yeah. So I can't buy. I can't buy any more than fifty thousand. Can't buy any more than fifty thousand dollars in Apple, so that's my number of shares. So I put shares here. Does that look right to everyone? Yeah. All right. It's always the risk of like you know coding live that your ability to think about math completely goes away. <laughs> number of shares times price. Okay. All right. So. Um, all right, so we get, well, okay, we made like, you know, <coughs> made like 30 grand in 2008, and then a little more in 2009, and um, since then it hasn't been doing all that much, probably because the, the trades become smaller and smaller as Apple's stock price um, uh, goes up. So, but still, I guess the sharp ratio in 2013 is, you know, 12. But, uh, should probably check that and see what's going on. But, uh, yeah. On the, on the where function, uh, is that so? N NP is one of the variables. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I glossed over that at the beginning. So so NP is NumPy. So okay. That's the like the base array library. So in you know in in R this would be if else. Ah, okay. um, in MATLAB it would just be where. So yeah. the the in R where you do an index and you pass a a, a logical. Uh, a logical time series, or a logical array, is that what, is that what? Yeah, so here if we wanted to say, you know, let's find, um, let's find days, days where that we made um, either lost 2% or more, 
well, I don't know what the, what the magnitudes are like in this data, but so if we could do, if we say, oh, so the same. take absolute value greater than 0 0.02, and then, yeah, so that returns a logical logical time series, and then you can index. Okay, so the same way. into it with that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oops, so these are in dollars, so let's say, let's try days that we made more than $1,000. Okay. So those 2008, there were a lot of very positive days, and then, uh, yeah. <coughs> um, okay, so that's about all I had. I, I was going to do more stocks. Uh,